All right. Well, uh, my name is Creighton Piper. I'm uh, actually an air traffic controller by trade, if you can believe that. But um, I spend all of my off-duty time with crypto answers, uh, researching, and trying to find the, the best, the most promising uh, projects out there with respect to uh, blockchain and uh, crypto. And uh, that's yep. how we came across you. So um, I understand you've had a very uh, exciting and successful business career. You even spent time with... Uh, Procter & Gamble, a top 25, Fortune 500 company. So uh, I know you have a lot to bring to the table for uh, Digital Town. Um, so tell me more about that. How did you uh, become CEO of Digital Town? Yeah, so uh, Digital Town actually is a pre-existing public company. Uh, I was invited by the board of directors of uh, Digital Town to come on board. Um, and I had not actually run a public company before. So it was an interesting opportunity. Uh, they were already a client of one of my other companies, uh, Epic, EPIK.com, which is a full service registrar, uh, like a GoDaddy. And uh, so as a result of that, that engagement, uh, I was actually kind of impressed with the board and they gave me free reign to set the strategy. So uh, with that, I, I came on board in May of 2015. Uh, and then in, in uh, September of 2015, I laid out a plan for the board uh, that there would be an opportunity to create a global smart city platform, a cloud-based platform that would allow any city to be a smart city. And they approved that, that agenda. Uh, and then by January 2016, we had it funded and we're off to the races uh, with five acquisitions completed since January 2016. Here we are uh, launching a global platform that lets any city be a smart city. All right. So for... Uh... For those who don't know what a smart city is, uh, can you explain that? What, what exactly is a smart city? Well, that's a great question, Creighton. Um, smart city is actually something that is not very well defined. Um, the whole point of it is, in fact, the idea of using uh, digital technologies to be able to connect stakeholders in order to co-create quality of life. Uh, that is probably the highest level definition of what is a smart city. Uh, for some cities, uh, it comes in the form of technologies like smart street lights and smart trash cans uh, and, and traffic lights that uh, change to green at the appropriate time. But in reality, the opportunity with smart cities is much bigger. And anybody who looks at the recent success of the likes of Uber or Airbnb can clearly see what happens when you connect stakeholders on the buy side and the sell side in the transaction so that the platform serves as an intermediary connecting stakeholders in order to affect an outcome. Well, cities can learn a lot from that. And really what uh, smart cities are about, as we look at it as a cloud platform, is about connecting those stakeholders. And we do it uh, in, a, in a tiered structure, uh, smart government, um, economic development, civic engagement, uh, digital inclusion, and smart tourism. So that, that stack of five functions uh, is basically what uh, the Digital Town platform delivers, but with a very novel twist, which is in our architecture, uh, a smart city can be a self-funding project. In other words, instead of being primarily dependent on government grants um, and, and tax-based spending, uh, this is a platform that actually is self-funding through transactions that citizens, whether they be residents or visitors, are already doing. So instead of uh, those transactions being mediated through the likes of Amazon and Airbnb and OpenTable uh, and Expedia, those transactions can all be mediated through a uh, city-specific platform. Wow, that's impressive. All right. Um, so then what, what is the, the mission of Digital Town? Like, what do you bring to the, what the, uh, the market every day? Well, uh, the mission of Digital Town is actually to create a global smart city network. So instead of every city having a siloed effort that lacks interoperability, our approach actually is to equip uh, every city with a, a, a city-specific platform like Nashville.city or San Diego.city or Smart.London, Smart.Miami. Uh, more than 22,000 cities now on the platform uh, for the purposes of being able to connect uh, citizens uh, and other stakeholders to each other for the purposes of being able to search, uh, share, and, and shop local. But to do that all through an interoperable network that is connected to a single sign-on and a shared platform. The, the, the term that is used in academia, uh, anybody who has read the book uh, Throwing uh, Rocks at the Google Bus will recognize the term platform cooperativism. Platform cooperativism basically speaks to the idea that says you can have shared technology but distributed ownership. So in effect, 
by creating a framework which allows uh, citizens in one part of the world to own their city portal and citizens in another part of the world to own their city portal, but having a shared cloud-based technology, you have a check and balance, right? You have the framework that basically enables interoperability very much like the way Uber, say, works, uh, but with a check and balance designed to, pre to prevent and safeguard against market abuses and to also align incentives. So if you look at the market cap of Uber, let's say it's $80 billion on a good, good day, um, what's happening is essentially a lopsided economy. You're seeing uh, commissions rising, uh, 30, 40, 50 percent of the gross revenue going to the platform as opposed to the driver. Uh, as Uber makes the transition to self-driving or autonomous vehicles, uh, those uh, commissions will gravitate to 100% for the platform and 0% for the driver. So it's essentially an unbalanced economy that is aligned in sentence. So you create a framework of federated or shared ownership. You actually create a framework that is both uh, sustainable from the standpoint of aligned incentives, but also a, a framework for uh, individual accountability. So if any given city uh, goes off the rails in terms of uh, no longer having an interest in being part of that platform. It's simply a DNS change uh, for that particular city portal. So that's, uh, I think, really what is a huge departure from the traditional winner-take-all winner, winner take all platform economy that has basically characterized 2015, 2016, 2017. Wow, interesting. That's, that sounds very promising. I like the idea that it's self funding. Um, yeah. um, that's probably my favorite part of it. Uh, you mentioned London. That's uh, was that your newest uh, city that you brought to into the smart economy? Well, so uh, in June of this year, we actually launched Smart London at uh, the London uh, uh, Expo. Uh, they have a uh, an annual event uh, that is essentially uh, called London Tech Week. It is the uh, equivalent of South by Southwest, but for the United Kingdom and for Western Europe. Um, and we actually hosted a uh, an event there. Uh, a uh, smart London uh, event in a traditional town hall built in the 1800s, completely restored, uh, live streamed to the world. And uh, that event was attended by dignitaries from across the private sector and the public sector. And we actually conducted a hackathon with more, more than 400 teams participating using our, our smart London developer toolkit. And I think it provides a great template. Uh, there's also an excellent video uh, that was done, a documentary video, about four minutes long, uh, that, uh, that explained about this initiative called Smart Up London. And I think it is a template that every city around the world can adopt and uh, apply for its own uh, stakeholders. So uh, do you have your next city targeted already? What, what, uh, well, we've already gone live now uh, in, in London, in uh, Nashville, now uh, San Diego and Miami uh, are next on deck, but in fact, more than 20,000 other cities are live. Uh, so if you go to your city, uh, typically city.city .city is the format, uh, then oftentimes you will see a, um, a, 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 a button on the homepage that says join the movement. Um, and if you go to San Diego.city, for example, or smart.miami, you'll see a button that says join the movement. And what that refers to is the notion that uh, a, a legal resident of that city uh, can uh, can claim or reserve their unit of ownership so that when the actual uh, deployment con uh, takes place of the airdrop, uh, all of those verifiable citizens will get their, their coin at no cost. Uh, so in effect, 80% uh, of the coins uh, for every city will be owned at the start by locals. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, this is a question I was going to ask you. Um, I Coming in, I, I did not think there was a coin associated with the digital talent, but is there going to be, or has there already been an ICO? Well, so every every city will have its own blockchain uh, that defines the ownership registry of that city portal. So that city platform comprised of web and mobile app and uh, open API for the purposes of adding new extension applications for the public sector and the private sector um, can be owned now by a distributed set of stakeholders. Uh, so to the extent that a municipality doesn't license the platform outright, we provide essentially the organizing framework uh, to allow multiple stakeholders, the citizens included, to be able to own it. And so typically, uh, to the extent that the first 80% isn't fully claimed by the citizens, then what happens is 
the balance is made available to uh, local stakeholders like uh, chambers of commerce, uh, trade association, by local advocacy groups, and then ultimately whatever is left unallocated is distributed through a reverse auction. And that reverse auction immediately upon its conclusion defines the initial trading price uh, of that unit of blockchain. At that point, uh, both locals and non-locals can buy and sell those units. So initially, 80% of the units are by design allocated to local stakeholders. Once it's been allocated, uh, you know, if, if Jacksonville wants to own a piece of Miami, uh, they can, right? If uh, San Francisco wants to own a piece of Los Angeles, they can. And if Boston wants to own a piece of New York, they can. But initially, 80% of those units, those coins, will be by design allocated to legal residents of that city. Are, are the coins live now? Can you, can you buy them? You can, you can reserve them now. So uh, the actual airdrop hasn't taken place. Uh, right now, uh, what uh, citizens can do is they can claim, uh, they can reserve their unit uh, and by visiting any of the city portals where they're a legal resident, they can, they can claim that coin. So the moment that airdrop uh, occurs, uh, they'll be notified that it has been added to their smart wallet. So every citizen in the world will get a smart wallet, right? So if you create an account on any digital town powered smart city, you will get a smart wallet. That smart wallet is single sign-on for the world, for public sector and private sector, and also is a uh, stored value uh, repository, uh, cloud wallet, uh, for um, your uh, digital town coin, uh, as well as any other coins that you would acquire in any other cities, but also a stored value account for making direct purchases with local merchants or with the public sector. So you can imagine right now as a citizen of any city, you'll probably be using eight to 12 different logins to be able to access the services of the municipality, parks and recreation, business licensing, uh, utility bill, whatever those different services are, and it's complete chaos. So what Digital Town does is it solves that issue by creating that single sign-on that can be used for both the public sector and the private sector and so now with that same wallet that you use to, for example, sign up for parks and recreation, uh, you can now buy from a local merchant, a restaurant, a retailer, service provider, lodging provider, all through this uh, cloud hosted platform that becomes, for all intents and purposes, uh, the, the home page that you would use as a resident of that city. So instead of starting your day on Amazon or Google, you might start your day on, on your specific city portal, uh, Nashville.city, Smart.Miami, et cetera. Hmm, all right. So then the the uh, the coin associated with the digital town, is that going to be traded on the open exchanges like uh, Bitfinex or something like that, or only used uh, within your system? Well, initially it will be uh, traded on the on the closed platform. We are absolutely open to partnering with other syndication partners for the purposes of expanding the array of exchanges where these units can be bought and sold. So long as it's compatible. Uh, with, with the blockchain, then uh, there's not really uh, necessarily a, uh, a priori limitation that would prevent us from making those uh, units available to be traded on other exchanges. Okay, so uh, in theory, um, in the future, once the airdrop happens and uh, everyone has their coins, I could trade my Ethereum for uh, a city smart coin or my Bitcoin for a city smart coin? Exactly right. Exactly okay. right. Gotcha. So whatever the medium of exchange is that uh, buyer and seller wish to use to be able to complete the transaction, we'll, we will support that. Okay, all right. Um, so then in layman's terms, what you're trying to do is um, keep shopping local. Like um, if someone in, in New York wants to buy a product, you're, they're, you're trying to essentially keep their funds within New York. Is, is that right. kind of... Right, exactly right. Uh, so whether a city is a large city or more typically uh, a medium-sized city where there's this sense of community and the desire to stem the tide against winner-take-all platforms, this provides a framework. But at the same time, what we're trying to solve for is how do you create a, a, a mechanism whereby a given citizen would have an incentive to change their behavior. Okay. And um, so the search engine that, that you designed to... Uh, facilitate all these, um, finding the products that, that uh, people are going to buy and sell. Um, that search engine, the technology is called Smart Search, is that right? That's correct. And that is your um, proprietary technology? Does anyone else have this right now? 
Well, it's actually a, a composite of a proprietary technology and then also uh, licensed search engine technology. So, you know, clearly search engine technology has been around for a while and we didn't presuppose that we would go out and, and build a local search engine from the ground up without using pre-existing technology. But what's different about this particular search engine is that it is truly smart. So if you do a search for a service uh, within your local community, you're going to get the results from that search uh, in a way that is actually transactionally smart. So you do a search for a restaurant, you'll be able to find a restaurant and book a table. You search for a retail item, you'll be able to make an e-commerce purchase. You search for a service provider, you can book an appointment. As opposed to the traditional Google or Bing model, you do a search and you have to click through and now navigate the user interface that you've never seen before and try to figure out how to engage with it transactionally and then wonder what it is that that organization is doing with your personally identifying information or your payment methods, right? So by virtue of using a unified single sign-on with a smart wallet, we can create an experience where the web adapts to you, the web is personalized and it is secure. So if you, for example, uh, visit a restaurant portal, uh, that restaurant portal is powered by a digital town smart menu platform, and it knows that you are, for example, say vegan, or that you uh, are diabetic, or uh, you have other dietary preferences, it can intelligently show you menu items that map to your dietary preference and show them the language of your choice and in the currency of your choice. Think about how much better the web would work if all of this structured data could be rendered through the lens of something that is personalized to your personal circumstance and preference. And that, in effect, is what the semantic web has offered up, but the practical consideration is that nobody has deployed it in a this consistent way, uh, aligning the incentives of the local stakeholders, and that is precisely where the digital town approach of engaging the municipality, the trade associations, chambers of commerce provides an accelerant for being able to make the switch to this very uh, uh, overdue paradigm uh, where the web is smart uh, and adaptive to, to your personal preferences and we're, we're not endlessly re-entering uh, assigning information and then wondering who's doing what with whose data. Okay, all right. So uh, in cities like London and um New York, where, where this uh, technology is live, how many people are, are using it in those areas? Well, so uh, in, in uh, the, the case of London, uh, we have actually um, rolled out the platform initially to um, an early adopter community of uh, what we call smart Londoners who were involved in our uh, launch event. And, it, and, and it's uh, adding a steady stream of uh, new users every day, uh, while at the same time uh, we are engaging with municipalities, trade associations, chambers of commerce, informing them of uh, this new platform that is coming. And uh, there will be a global launch uh, among uh, all citizens around the world uh, in, in early 2018. But in the meantime, early adopters are getting on board and the citizens and, and merchants, uh, and most importantly, the municipalities, are putting their operations in place using this unified platform that will allow uh, people from around the world to have true interoperability, something that is obviously very much overdue. 2018, all right, that's good info. Uh, just out of curiosity, is there any city in Texas that will be able to participate in this? Oh, you already now can go visit uh, Dallas.city, Austin.city, San Antonio.city. Uh, so um, most of the big cities uh, will be on the platform, and many of the smaller cities. And in fact, it's interesting because a lot of times it's the medium sized cities that are most enthusiastic about this technology. They're the ones who are suffering the greatest from the transition to winner take all. Hmm. All right, well, I live pretty close to San Antonio, so in uh, 2018, when that comes around, I'll have to check that out. It sounds... In fact, San Antonio will be live before that. Uh, so San Antonio goes live next month. Uh, the International City Managers Conference is in San Antonio this year. And so San Antonio, the city, you can already preview it, is live and the commercial launch to the merchants in the San Antonio community is next month. That's perfect. I'm about to go TUI to San Antonio for a month, in, a, in about a month and a half, so I will check it perfect. out. Yeah, I promise. Perfect. Um, so, coming into this interview, I did a lot of research on, uh, on the company, and I noticed that you are publicly trading. I found you on Yahoo Finance, and um, it almost seems like the, um, the company's stock is trading almost in line with the crypto market. Um, do you think yeah. there, there is a correlation there? Uh, I, I don't think it's that. I think it's mostly because of being an OTCVB uh, company that is uh, a company that is uh, somewhat thinly traded. However, the company is uh, 
fully audited um, and has governance practices that are commensurate with more of a NASDAQ traded company. And with five equities done, mostly with the company stock as currency, you know, we've added a lot of capability, you know, a significant asset. And I think the market will, in, in short, short order, uh, recognize what we've built and uh, the market will reflect that in the stock price. Do you have any plans possibly to, um, I know there are requirements, um, share price requirements in order to um, list the, uh, the stock on a, a different exchange. Do you have any uh, intentions, any plans maybe to do a reverse split with your surprise to be able to list it, uh, be able to be listed on a different exchange? You know, uh, with the market cap uh, that it has and the market cap that we think it probably warrants, um, I, I don't know that a reverse split would be needed. Uh, you do the math um, on uh, 22,000 cities and to ascribe uh, a valuation of just $1,000 a city, you'd be a $22 million market cap. If you ascribe a valuation of $10,000, you're at $220 million. So really, uh, from the standpoint of kind of the fundamental story and how high is up story, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, um, an, a an asymmetric market uh, that has not yet become broadly aware of what it is that Digital Town is building. The audacity of it is far broader than Uber, than Uber uh, in more cities, uh, covering more categories. Uh, providing an organizing framework that is actually aligned with the incentives of municipalities, unlike Uber, who is constantly battling with municipalities, uh, you know, from a governance standpoint. Uh, and Airbnb, same thing. They're constantly battling with zoning ordinance in the, with the municipality. And so by taking an approach that it basically partners with the municipality, you know, we are, we are the new guys. We are the white knights uh, that are enabling those organizations, municipalities in specific, to better defend themselves against the likes of uh, Amazon and OpenTable and Airbnb and uh, Uber especially. So the winner take all platforms that are essentially siphoning ever larger amounts of wealth out of these local economies uh, while they provide a certain uh, consumer benefit are doing it uh, in a manner that is not sustainable, right? Because it will over time deplete the resources of the communities that they so-called serve. So we are looking for how do you create a, a way for that to be uh, as convenient, as familiar as what it is that people are used to, but in a way that is actually economically sustainable and that lifts up the prospects of uh, all stakeholders. Perfect. So in other words, um, you're saying when you go live in 2018, that's when the, the share price will really, uh, really take off and there will be... Let, 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 me, let me qualify that. So we're already live. Cities can already license. Uh, Consumers can already sign up to claim their token. What I described in 2018 is more the, um, the Big Bang Super Bowl uh, ad, if you will. So if you think about it from the standpoint of um, Apple Computer, uh, one of the great marketing success stories of all time, uh, they were a relatively unknown company in 1983, 84. Uh, what did they do in 1984? If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's the famous 1984 ad of Apple Computer, which um, depicted Apple as the revolutionary, changing, challenging Big Brother, and and prevailing, and that that singular event uh, turned Apple Computer from being kind of a uh, niche uh, hobby uh, a company that was used by a few early adopters to becoming a, a mainstream national phenomena and ultimately a global phenomena. So, you know, really, what this is about in the present state is building. Um, success models and, and, and working out some of the procedural kinks in the process with the objective of being positioned for massive global scale through a seminal kind of marketing event, right? And so that marketing event, whether it's a Super Bowl ad uh, or, or other, it was, still remains to be determined. But we're thinking about these things, both in terms of architecting for scale and in terms of uh, how do we get the message out and, and create momentum around a global movement whose time has come. I'm glad you clarified that. That's uh, that's good information. Um, so th this question is completely um, not connected to your company at all. What is your opinion on the price action that we've seen in the crypto market as of late? Do you do you even keep up with it, or are you more just focused on on the company right now? Well, you know, so uh, so I also I I do trade in in Bitcoin mainly. I haven't really dabbled in Ethereum or Litecoin or any of the other exotic new up and comers. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I thought that uh, there was a bit of a, a window. Uh, so uh, unloaded about two-thirds of my position between 4,300 and 
4,900, uh, ironically. Um, and uh, uh, so relatively light actually on uh, Bitcoin right now relative to where I have been. Um, and I think that uh, the dust needs to settle uh, a little bit on this kind of speculative froth. Uh, but I think the larger point is that people have to ask themselves, you know, what is backing the coins, right? And I think the, the differentiation between what a digital town is building and, and the traditional kind of um, cryptocurrency is that um, there's an asset dependent to it, right? If you actually look at the valuation of the asset called San Antonio.city, uh, Dallas.city, uh, Nashville.city, San Diego.city, and those platforms have transactions associated with them. There's a genuine market value associated with the future stream of cash flows that can be discounted to present day. No different than you would value any other business. So it becomes a, 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 an, an asset and a store of value, which can in turn be traded. And so if somebody wanted to, for example, uh, hold value in the form of a crypto asset, and then turn around and convert it to Bitcoin for the purposes of, 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 of making a consumer purchase, they could do that. What I question is, given the fact that we see like 30% intraday volatility, as we saw today, um, in, uh, in the, the value of, of Bitcoin, uh, you know, is that a great store of value? I'm not sure that it is. Uh, I think it's a great uh, transaction platform, but I'm not sure that I would necessarily uh, want to um, uh, you know, a stomach uh, having a large amount of personal wealth uh, stored in it, right? I would say from the standpoint of asset allocation, if somebody has three to 5% of their assets sitting in Bitcoin, uh, great, uh, that seems like a very prudent idea. Uh, but I wouldn't uh, view it as something that I would store 70 or 80% of my wealth. You see, you, you see the problem. Bitcoin as an asset, as an asset store is not very good. Uh, it's pretty good as a speculative um, asset. It's pretty good as a um, uh, anonymous uh, transaction vehicle, but as a store of value, I'm not so sure. So that's one of the things that I like about this approach to digital town is it would allow you as a resident of San Antonio to own a piece of the digital future of San Antonio. And you would know, you would have inside information about whether or not it's uh, growing in value or, or, or whether it's stalling based on how merchants are engaging with it, how the municipality is engaging with it, uh, and in effect, at the same time, uh, improving the economic outlook for the community where you live or work or both. So you don't necessarily see uh, a digital town coin or smart coin com really competing with Bitcoin. You see them more so working hand in hand. I see it going hand in hand. I see it as a as a as a blockchain based framework, uh, as a digital store of value. Uh, you know, instead of buying a stock on a public exchange and being subject uh, to commission and and being subject to the regulatory constraints of being a publicly traded equity, it becomes possible for um, a, a citizen or other stakeholder to have an ownership interest in a, in the city portal that they know intimately because they use it. So um, long term, the price of Bitcoin. Do you see it? Um, I, we see a lot of people calling for you know five hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, one million dollar Bitcoin in the future. Do you think there's any possibility of that long long term, ten plus years from now? Um, honestly, I, I don't think that it achieves that type of um, you know kind of heady outcome. Mathematically, uh, from a supply demand perspective, uh, we have to look at these things through the lens of uh, all of the competing alternative stores of value. So if you view um, uh, cryptocurrencies as a store of value, uh, it's, a, it's got a challenge because you know now there's Bitcoin and Litecoin and Ethereum and now thousands of others uh, coming online that all will be serving as stores of value and all will have their affinity groups that would have an interest in holding wealth in the form of those coins. So um, it's an infinite supply, um, uh, you know, being matched against finite demand, because if every individual even owned 3% of their net worth in the form of uh, cryptocurrency or 5% or 10%, the point is that's mathematically limited. You could have an unlimited number of cryptocurrencies. 
I'm not sure I understand what you're saying there. Um, so well, supply and demand. So supply and demand. So the more you produce of, of coins, because there's another ICO, you know, every day you every day you, you look, there's another credible ICO coming online. Right. Uh, and so that is adding to supply. Doesn't mean that uh, Bitcoin isn't going to reign supreme. I think Bitcoin for the foreseeable future is the one that kind of created and defines the category. It's the one that most merchants or more, more merchants have integrated than any other. For example, uh, I also run a registrar called Epic, epik.com. You can use Epic or use Bitcoin to buy and sell domains uh, on Epic. We were one of the first to do it uh, and, and it's actually become quite popular. Um, and the likelihood of integrating, you know, a long list of cryptocurrencies um, for any merchant, I think is kind of limited. Uh, you know, there's, there's a certain number of me methods of payment that will likely to be displayed uh, on a shopping cart checkout. And right now it's, you know, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, Discover, uh, PayPal, and, and then a, maybe one or more cryptocurrencies. But I'm not sure that you're going to see the typical shopping cart displaying uh, a drop-down list with 300 different methods of payment. You know, could happen, um, but for the moment, I'm not sure that that's in the cards. So I think there's going to be a very finite number of, um, of transactional cryptocurrencies. I'm not going to say winner take all, um, but I would say that there will be a finite number of, of uh, preferred cryptocurrencies simply because of um, network effect, right? So Ethereum uh, may well be the one that, that uh, comes up right behind Bitcoin. I will agree with Fred Wilson and others uh, that Ethereum might well be the, the, the one to watch because it is actually you know, very cleverly architected uh, and has a credible organization behind it. Um, and uh, that could rival the likes of Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, I see guys trading in and out of Bitcoin, you know, uh, playing the, the, the intraday volatility between uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and some folks taking a speculative flyer on, on Litecoin and then the other cast of characters behind it. But I think uh, from the standpoint of kind of the buy and hold steady Freddies that define the market cap uh, of a cryptocurrency, um, you know, it requires transactional engagement getting merchants to accept it uh, in their shopping carts. And that's where Bitcoin is far ahead of everybody else. That's definitely fair. I think I misunderstood you earlier where, um, I mean, obviously Bitcoin has a uh, finite supply, only 21 million Bitcoin, but you're saying there are an infinite amount of coins that can, that can be produced. They may all have limited supplies, but infinite amount of coins. Infinite number of coins, exactly. Gotcha. And uh, I think that uh, in the case of uh, the, the digital town approach from the standpoint of using blockchain chain as a uh, ownership registry for, by definition, a finite number of coins, right? Every city has one coin per citizen. Um, there is a, a way for someone to kind of do well by do, and do good, right? I call that kind of enlightened capitalism, that you actually have the ability to basically have an ownership interest in a city where you're a stakeholder, uh, and uh, uh, benefit economically, both in terms of the intraday trading value of that unit of interest, but also uh, the ultimate cash out to the municipality. Because at the end of the day, if you are at the city of San Antonio and San Antonio city has become the de facto um, search engine that citizens use to search local, share local and buy local, then uh, the city of San Antonio would be kind of a fool to not own that, right? because right now, as a, as a resident of, say, San Antonio, how often do you go to the city website? Probably almost never. Well, you wouldn't be alone there. Uh, most people don't go to their city website. But as the majority of commerce gravitates toward a digital playing field, it's kind of hard as a city to ignore the digital playing field. And so this approach of creating essentially local search engines that are tied to uh, local payment processing, local merchant processing, um, but also uh, built around federated ownership using blockchain uh, creates a way for the city to basically engage. And then when the city's ready, the city can buy it. And the city is cashing out the local owners. Gotcha. Well, um, I can tell you this, I'm even more confident in uh, digital town than I am, than I was going into this interview. That this sounds very promising, very exciting. And uh, I will definitely look into it when I go to San Antonio. Um, Great. I'll make use of it. That, that sounds awesome. Um, well, um, Mr. Robert Monster, that's an awesome name, by the way. <laughs> CEO you. of Digital Town. Uh, thank you so much for um, taking some time out of your day to talk with us. It's been very enlightening. Um, I know I've learned a lot. 
Um, thank you very much. Okay, great. Great chatting with you.